in the meantime, let me do this. Uh, so you have either a stochastic, a stochastic uh, gravitational waves uh, or coherent uh, gravitational waves. Uh, the first ones are the uh, um, are motivated by early universe signals. This includes inflation, uh, cosmic strings, phase transitions, and then um, uh, in the panel at the bottom. Uh, you see uh, the example of uh, primordial black holes or in general exotic compact objects. Okay, now uh, the, let's say the foundational work that uh, is relevant for cavities started uh, with the work of uh, Gerstenstein. And uh, actually, uh, Today we call uh, the effect that is used uh, the inversion, the inverse Gerstein effect, and uh, this is very interesting. Actually, uh, while he was uh, proposing this idea, he also uh, was thinking of uh, interferometers. He was one of the first persons to think of uh, using uh, interferometers for the detection of, gravi of gravitational waves. So, I find this very uh, amusing because. Uh, yeah, okay, so the same person who proposed this also was thinking of uh, this idea that can be implemented in haloscopes. And the idea is very simple. So uh, suppose you have a gravitational wave that is entering in a region where there is a magnetic field. So according to Einstein, uh, the gravitational wave is a perturbation on space and time, right? So this perturbation acting on the magnetic field will create uh, uh, an oscillating, oh, sorry. Somebody's moving the. Yeah. So, uh, this uh, will create an oscillation on the magnetic field. And uh, as a result, uh, the magnetic field will create an electric field. And according to Maxwell, this is just an electromagnetic wave, right? So it's very simple a perturbation of, uh, of uh, the metric. Uh, acting on the magnetic field creates an electromagnetic wave. So that's uh, the Gerstenstein effect or the inverse Gerstenstein effect. And uh, more or less, uh, that's how uh, this idea works in practice. Now, uh, there are many things that I would like to, 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 to emphasize. So the first one is, this is not quantum gravity. Uh, the, the rate associated to this process uh, does not involve H bar. So that means that uh, we are not talking about quantum gravity or anything that involves the quantum nature of uh, the gravitational field. This is just pure GR coupled with electromagnetism. You can uh, apply this idea in a cosmological context. And I did this uh, with my collaborator, uh, Valerie Domke, a few years ago. And what is more important for that is that, of course, this process is strictly analogous to axion dark matter conversion. And uh, actually, people uh, uh, thought about this uh, and uh, 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 obtained these limits uh, a few years ago by recasting or reproposing uh, axion experiments into this framework. Okay, here you can see uh, what uh, Oscar Alps can do. Alps 2, and what uh, uh, the EXO uh, experiment could de uh, detect uh, using the investigation effect. Um, more important than that, and this is a take home message here, we are still very far from testing early universe signals. The reason is, uh, this is the, uh, the so-called nucleosynthesis limit, and all these uh, bounds or, or limits are way above the uh, nucleosynthesis limit, okay? So of course, the goal uh, of, this, uh, of this business is that uh, to, to, to propose ideas that will allow us to go deeper into this, uh, uh, in, into this plane, okay? Yes, this is super interesting. Uh, this is a calculation actually originally done by Weinberg. So uh, uh, these are just the gravitational waves produced by the sun. So the sun is a, is a plasma. And uh, well, I mean, can, think, can be conceived as a plasma, and uh, the these thermal fluctuations uh, produce uh, 
uh, gravitational waves, of course, that's very small. And uh, yeah, so Weinberg was thinking of this in 75. And yeah, this is the calculation uh, by him. These are uh, what happens uh, with Hawking radiation uh, in black holes. And as you see, uh, we are very far from probing anything that is realistic. No? Okay. Now, the thing is, of course, we have, uh, if in, in, in axion physics, you have more experiments than just this axion photon conversion, right? You have uh, many, many different uh, uh, set of experiments. You have helioscopes, haloscopes, purely lab experiments, and uh, we have heard about them uh, during the entire week and during the workshop. So what I will do now is to focus in haloscopes, okay? So well, I was asked to talk about that. <laughs> okay, so how, how does it work in practice? So let's just remember, uh, I mean, I don't have to explain this to this audience, but uh, let's just recall that an axion uh, acts as a source terms to the Maxwell's equations. So you can think of um, uh, an effective current induced by, by the axion. And uh, this effective current, of course, uh, creates uh, electromagnetic effects. This is not a real current, this is just, uh, so it's not something made of electrons and protons. It's just uh, an, a description of what uh, the action can do in terms of electromagnetic effects. Well, effectively, the same is true for uh, gravitational waves, okay? So that, that's really the analogy. That's all you need to know. <laughs> Essentially, uh, gravitational waves also generate an effective current. Uh, but this is an effective description. We have to be careful about this. And I, I have a few slides on this because uh, I think this is a, a very important uh, topic. And uh, actually there has been a lot of discussion in the literature about this. There, there is, I mean, you can do, I mean, as in anything in, in, in GR, you can do any calculation in any frame you like, right? But there is one frame that is uh, uh, very intuitive and uh, very easy to, to, to understand in terms of uh, what's going on in physics. And that's the proper detector frame. Uh, th this idea goes back to Fermi. These are Fermi coordinates. And it was substantially developed in the 60s and the 70s in the context of uh, interferometers. And the idea is to take uh, uh, the closest uh, uh, coordinate system to what, uh, uh, to what an inertial system is. Okay, so in that, in that uh, coordinate system, uh, the coordinates are given by uh, ideal rigid rulers, and you typically find this sort of relationship, okay? So uh, the, the, really the metric along the axis of the, uh, this uh, reference frame looks like a Minkowski. And furthermore, and this has been, uh, I mean, it's, it's very well known in the, in, the, uh, in the context of gravitational physics, uh, in this particular frame, uh, the effect of the gravitational uh, wave on an, uh, in any test mass is a Newtonian force, okay? That's why it's very uh, intuitive. Uh, essentially, you can think of uh, uh, just like a laboratory uh, experiment, and then the gravitational wave creates effects that are uh, described by Newtonian physics. This is not always the case, in particular, for instance, people sometimes discuss the TT frame. There are other frames. Of course, the physics should not depend on the frame, but in this frame, it's very simple to calculate things because of this. If you use another system of reference, of course, you can do uh, uh, calculations in that frame, but then you have to keep in mind that the, 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 the frame uh, has physics that is not simply given by Newtonian physics. Um, this is very important for haloscopes, and this was actually in the context of haloscopes was only pointed out like last year, essentially. And um, yeah, so th these are uh, 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 well before I will discuss this paper uh, in uh, in a second. Uh, but I just want to tell you that uh, this is very important and it's a key a key aspect of this. Now, as I said, uh, there is a a strong parallel between action electrodynamics and gravitational wave electrodynamics due to this effect. So let's, let's just recap in this table. So one example is of action electrodynamics is action photon conversion. 
And uh, in the, 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 um, the case of gravitational waves that corresponds to the Kirchenstein effect or the inverse Kirchenstein effect. Now, um, there is an effective current and uh, it turns out that you can just out of mathematical reasons, you can introduce this P and M vectors. These are effective polarization among netization vectors. And uh, this is known in, uh, this was known in the case of actions since uh, the 2018, I guess. And uh, what I did with my collaborators uh, was that uh, to show that actually that's also true for uh, gravitational waves. So these are effective things. So you can think of it as mathematical objects, but uh, they essentially follow the same sort of uh, uh, physics that you find when you describe uh, materials that have effective and uh, effective polarization and effective magnetization. Now, of course, for action electrodynamics, uh, the, the, the benchmark that everyone has in mind is the QCD action. Uh, and then you can prove by this uh, very simple estimate that whenever you um, reach the QCD line in any of these experiments, that corresponds to an uh, um, amplitude of gravitational waves of the order of 10 to the minus 22. Okay, good. So let's talk about uh, microwave cavities. So haloscopes based on microwave cavities. So here, uh, the, the, the physics is very simple. I actually don't have to <laughs> explain to you uh, what happens uh, for actions. So essentially, you know, an action generates this effective current. The effective current um, it creates, uh, induces a, 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 an electromagnetic signal. And when the electromagnetic signal uh, somehow matches one of the modes of the, of the cavity, it resonates, right? <clears throat> That's very simple. As I said, gravitational waves do exactly the same thing. They generate an effective current and uh, the effective current will create further uh, electric and magnetic fields. And those will source uh, something that will resonate if it matches the eigen modes of the cavity, okay? This is not my work. This is the work of these people here. Uh, where uh, they uh, will estimate what is the uh, amplitude or the strain sensitivity of gravitational waves in these experiments. And they conclude uh, this. Uh, so uh, you can see different experiments. And uh, as, I, as I said before, these are more or less in the ballpark of 10 to the minus 22. And um, okay, so these people uh, are these people. So they were the ones who uh, uh, made this crucial observation that you should work in the proper detector frame, because of course for cavities it's very important that uh, the the eigen modes which are associated to boundary conditions are under control. This doesn't happen, for instance, in the TT frame. So you have to be careful when you uh, choose the reference frame. Good. So now let me tell you about my work. So uh, actually, uh, what we did was to uh, um, consider haloscopes based on loop element detectors. So uh, here, the physics is similar. Uh, it's a bit more uh, involved, but it's very similar. So here, so let's, uh, for simplicity, let's consider this toroidal uh, magnetic field. So for uh, the case of axions, uh, the toroidal magnetic field, as I explained, induces a, an effective current. This effective current will source uh, uh, the Maxwell's equations inducing a magnetic flux at the center of, the, of this toroid. And there should be no magnetic flux if there is no exotic physics, right? So if you uh, measure something in here, uh, that's because, uh, well, you either have an action or a gravitational wave, right? Uh, Right, so this is, uh, well, I will go very fast over this because uh, what we have heard about this today, uh, essentially uh, you have the abracadabra experiment. We also consider the shaft experiment and there is uh, this uh, dark matter radio program. And we try to, uh, yeah, to, to estimate what would these experiments do uh, in terms of uh, gravitational wave sensitivity. Okay, so let's, uh, let me show you uh, how the magnetic field looks in this pickup loop for the case of a gravitational wave. It looks like that. It's uh, 
uh, I mean, the, 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 the conceptually speaking, it's very simple. <laughs> Usually calculations are very involved, but because it's gravitational wave physics, but uh, the, 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 the idea is very simple, right? So you here have a, a magnetic field in the, uh, um, in the direction of the pickup loop uh, that is put here at the center. And then um, uh, you find this uh, structure, which you don't find for actions. For, ax for actions, this is, this is just completely flat uh, in, uh, in terms of uh, angular dependence. Good. Things that we found and that uh, were, uh, that was a bit uh, hard to understand for us, only one polarization of the gravitational wave is uh, detected in this vanilla scenario with a normal pickup loop that is circular. There is a suppression at small frequencies and that, okay, that can be understood from the fact that uh, you have this, uh, so in, in one part, so from zero to pi, you have, well, from minus, pi, uh, sorry. From here to here in the blue region, you have negative values. In the red region, you have positive values. So when you consider the whole thing, it gives zero. And actually it's not zero, but it's something that is suppressed at small frequencies. Good. So, so uh, what we, we said in that paper at that point was, okay, uh, somehow it, it is very clear that we have to break a cylindrical symmetry. This is not what these experiments were designed for. These experiments were of course designed to detect, um, uh, or I mean with the idea of detecting axions. So th this, this would be, uh, the limit that we managed to place uh, ba uh, based on uh, uh, this uh, abracadabra uh, that, uh, observation. So we have this. Uh, if we don't uh, do anything with the uh, setup that was proposed, and if we include this uh, figure A pickup loop, you see there is a, an increase in sensitivity. And yeah, so I, I think this illustrates very well uh, what is going on uh, with this um, uh, with this business? Uh, so the sensitivity to gravitational waves is very uh, small. Okay. However, there is nothing else that is in that plane. So these are limits that are uh, uh, very novel, even though they are very small. Right. Uh, the other thing is. Of course, these experiments are not designed to detect gravitational waves. So you can improve this. And as a theorist, we very naively managed to uh, propose an idea of uh, how to improve this, right? Of course, I'm sure experimentalists will be able to do much better than that. And I, I think that's, that's the, the sort of game we want to play here. Uh, okay, so what we are going to discuss in the paper tomorrow, and um, among other things, uh, is the extension of this calculation to other configurations because uh, not all the uh, not all these experiments uh, are going to be toroids and in fact there are many proposals that involve solenoidal fields so what we did was okay we already know how to calculate these for toroidal fields so we just can go ahead and calculate what happens if you have toroidal fields and actually all these experiments i mean uh, conceptually are similar, but uh, they do uh, different things. They have different uh, configurations. For instance, some of them have the pickup loop inside. Some of them, like this one, is proposing to put the pickup loop outside. So, okay. And all these things are uh, what we do, uh, what we calculate in the paper tomorrow. And, okay, but, uh, so these calculations are very, uh, very complicated. But what we kept finding is that uh, there are cancellations. So the, the naive uh, proposal for actions somehow uh, does not work for gravitational wave as efficient as we would like to. So uh, we keep finding cancellations. So like, like, like the one that I described here. Uh, so yeah, for us, it was very puzzling. And then what we, try to do was to well, sit down and, and try to find an explanation. And as it always happens in physics, whenever such a thing happens, whenever you get zeros, is because there are uh, symmetry arguments. And in fact, you can derive uh, selection rules. This, this is the, one of the main topics of the paper tomorrow. 
So we, you, we consider different uh, uh, realizations of these uh, uh, experiments. So we can uh, write down, uh, or I mean, we can calculate what happens if we put the, uh, a solenoid and a pickup loop in the set direction, uh, pointing in the set direction, or we can do uh, the same thing if we have a toroid and, and so on and so forth, right? So what we find, as I said, is this uh, set of uh, selection rules, okay? So the first thing is we have to live with the fact that uh, there will be uh, omega square suppression. This will always happen. And uh, this has to do with, the, uh, uh, with how the gravitational wave interacts with the detector. And um, that can be understood very, uh, uh, very easily using uh, the proper detector frame, as I emphasized at the beginning of the talk. Uh, in the proper detector frame, uh, an explicit computation that actually uh, we did for the first time, as far as we are aware, uh, following, of course, the work of uh, the people who work on cavities. Um, uh, so the, 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 this calculation shows that the frequency is, uh, sorry, that the, yeah, that the frequency enters in the detector frame formula with omega square, okay? So this is unavoidable. However, in all these experiments, as I show here, uh, most of the time one finds actually suppressions that go like omega cube, omega cube, omega cube. Not only that, you also find that you detect one polariz either one polarization or the other, not both. So, uh, well, this can be understood easily. Uh, well, once you do this calculation many, many, many times. Uh, so we uh, wrote down three selection rules. So the selection rule number one, uh, for an instrument with azimuthal symmetry, uh, you get no contribution from the H cross polarization. So if you design an experiment that has, uh, well, uh, experiments such as uh, these ones, so lump element detector type of experiments, you find that the H cross gives no signal. Uh, so, okay, so then this is something to consider. Of course, that means that acid mutual symmetry is probably not good. It must be broken somehow. Uh, the second selection rule is that uh, uh, the, so if you have azimuthal symmetry, uh, regardless of this power, the flux is either proportional to H plus or H cross, but not to both, okay? And this is true to all orders in omega L. So this thing is only true uh, to order omega L square. And then uh, for an instrument with full cylindrical symmetry, and with this, we also mean uh, invariant on the reflections uh, uh, across the set plane, uh, the, the flux will contain uh, only even or all powers of, uh, the, uh, gravitation, of the gravitational wave frequency. Good, so th those are the selection rules. And so, so that means that, I mean, if, if, you, if you're planning to build an experiment or to propose an idea, well, you can have this uh, set of rules in mind. And actually, obviously all this suggests that if you want to detect actions and gravitational waves simultaneously, probably a simultal symmetry or cylindrical symmetry is not a good idea. This is uh, the final plot of our paper uh, where we put all the uh, uh, limits together. Um, so we consider this WIP, uh, WISP LC experiment, uh, uh, the dark matter god, dark matter cube, uh, dark matter uh, 50 liters. And assuming this figure eight, pick a loop or uh, the equivalent of that if you have a, a cylindrical, uh, sorry, a, a solenoidal configuration. Um, right, and then, and then, yeah, a few words on uh, the expected signals. So this is uh, what you will get if you have super radiance, very optimistically. And this is what you get in the most optimistic case of a primordial black hole generating gravitational waves. We're still very far from this. And uh, the, so the, actually there is a, if you compare this with our first paper, 
we have a different, uh, uh, I mean, a different plot, essentially because uh, in the first paper, uh, we just uh, did not take into account the different time scales and the signals. Uh, so the time scales involved in the signals and the detectors. And now we, we do, and uh, well, I invite you to have a look at the paper. Uh, but the point here is, of course, the take home message is, uh, uh, there are, so you can do something, so you can detect, uh, so you can, you can place limits on gravitational waves, but we are still far from uh, uh, benchmark signals uh, from uh, black holes or uh, super radiance. And uh, let me conclude. So the techniques developed for uh, detecting action dark matter can be potentially used to discover new sources of gravitational waves. And uh, selection rules in detectors exhibiting uh, cylindrical symmetry and force cancellations in the flux associated to gravitational waves. And uh, these cancellations can be avoided by changing the geometry of the, of the detector. And that's uh, very important, I think. And of course, with this, we demonstrate that for different detector geometries, uh, one can obtain a, a parametric increase of sensitivity, which is highly non-trivial. And uh, yeah, and then the final message is uh, different experimental proposals have coalesced on a strain sensitivity of the order of 10 to the minus 22. Uh, and this is still uh, is orders of magnitude away from signals of the early universe. And whether we can hope to prove such strain sensitivities, it's uh, something that remains to be determined. So, and thanks a lot. Well, thanks, Camilo. Any questions? Thank you. Um, so if I move some test masses in the laboratory, I can create a gravitational wave, right? Yeah. Yeah. Is there any kind of practically feasible regime in which that would be detectable with a halo scope? No, no of course not, because the gravitational, I mean, you, can, you have to think that, uh, Oh, let me see. This was very hard to detect. And these were uh, objects that uh, were coalescing, transforming like, uh, I think uh, for this particular case was 30 solar masses into energy. They're very big, but they're also very far away. Yeah, but still, I don't think you can move in mass. I mean, you can also, I mean, this, like, the example by Weinberg is also very good as well. This is the sun. <laughs> And this is still uh, very small. So I, I don't think you can generate gravitational waves by, well, I mean, you do, but this is negligible. Have you checked? No, okay. <laughs> but um, I'm, I'm, I'm on same time. Yeah. yeah, thanks for the talk. Um, um, yeah, the question is, uh, so gravitational waves also interact with the current, uh, which creates a magnetic field in the cavity, right? Yes. And with the current in the pickup loop. So does it uh, influence? Uh, uh, the result or somehow the equations that because naively it would influence uh... yes it actually does uh so um where was this as i emphasize here the effect of the gravitational force in this frame this is a frame dependent statement uh so the, the effect of the gravitational wave is to induce a newtonian force okay and everything I discussed so far is assuming that we neglect this Newtonian force. This is not true in general. And actually, uh, this, the, 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 this same people uh, put out a paper this, this year, a few months ago, this one, where they actually uh, uh, account for the fact that uh, these Newtonian forces also uh, deform or induce uh, um, signals mechanical signals on the cavity, okay? So that's, that's also, so that's, so you're right. This is an effect and it's important and it's under investigation. So this, so I invite you to have a look at this paper uh, if you want to see what happens, but essentially what happens is like, okay, you, you have the, the, the electromagnetic modes of the cavity, but the cavity also has a mechanical modes. And so the, the effect of the Newtonian force can be understood as uh, some overlap between these two things. Okay, thank you. But I meant yeah. actually even uh, like action of uh, on the electrons, so to say, so on the electromagnetic current, not on the walls. 
but I guess this is yeah, but somehow similar. Right? Yeah, yeah. This, I mean, the walls. I mean, the, the, the electrons that are on the walls feel this Newtonian force. Okay. Right? Yeah. Thank you. With your permission to raise my question, I mean, I mean the criticism. I will, I will, I will point out that your proposal is based on the analogy between the action, I mean, the equation of motion for the action case and the, the, the gravitational waves. But the analogy does not work because the gravitational wave induces more complicated contribution to the Maxwell's equation. I, I, I find it is impossible to, to avoid complications in the homogeneous part of the Maxwell equation in addition to the inhomogeneous part. And it doesn't matter. I mean, electric and magnetic field depend on the observer. And in corpus space, I mean, we, I mean, it is, I have proof that it is not possible. So the, the basic equation, I'm afraid you are using, which shows the analogy between action and gravitational waves does not apply. Yeah. Oh, we already have discussed. I mean, we are. Yeah, yeah. So let, let me, let, yeah, let me comment on that. Th thanks a lot. Actually, uh, from the discussion we have, I mean, well, I don't know. Uh, so, so I, I don't, I actually don't even think we disagree. Uh, I just think that uh, the, the the problem is that you are picturing this in a different frame. So, as I emphasized before, it's very important to 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 do the calculation in in, in a particular frame, right? So. No, that's the point, I think. So let, let, me, let me finish what I want to say. So if you, if you, if you work in the proper detector frame, right, what you, what you find is that, as I uh, said before, uh, the, uh, the experiment reacts to the gravitational wave with a Newtonian force, right? Now, your, your point is, okay, uh, this Newtonian force, or what the reaction of the experiment is not only on the walls, but also, on the magnetic field and the electric field, and that is impossible to somehow neglect uh, the fact that uh, the magnetic field is not uniform any longer, right? But in this frame, so that, that's correct, I would say. And I think in this frame, this shows up. So this effect can be calculated by considering the effect of these Newtonian forces on the uh, particles that are sourcing the fields. So the, 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 so the, 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 the Newtonian force will act on these particles, these particles, so the electrons that are running in the wires or the wires themselves. And these things will uh, produce a further effect in the electromagnetic field inside the cavity, right? But as I said, this is, uh, so we are working on the assumption that we neglect this Newtonian force. And if you consider the, the, these motions, uh, in the particular case of haloscopes, this, as I said, this uh, shows up as a, um, a mechanical deformation of the cavity, and this creates an effect. That's true. Yeah. So, I mean, you're, I mean, there, there is a conceptual mistake mm -hmm. made in defining the electric and the magnetic field in curved space time, and it is not possible to to avoid the, the complications in homogeneous part as well. Yeah, okay. So in this part, we disagree because for doing the calculation, you don't need to define electric and magnetic fields. You can work at the level of the a field strength tensor. You can write an equation for the field strength tensor, which is sources, which in, 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 in full GR is sourced by electromagnetic currents, and you can solve for that. You don't need to define electric and magnetic fields to do the calculation. Okay, but we have a disagreement on this and yeah, okay, I, I understand it. Yeah, so I have two questions if I may. Yeah. So the first is um, the Newtonian force and the direct coupling to the EM field, do they add and increase the signal or are there any cancellations to be expected? Uh, okay, this is a very good question. And uh, the, the first answer is, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, but the, the, yeah, I mean, this is related to the previous question. I mean, actually this in, uh, so these people claim that in certain part of the parameter space, this enhances the signal. And yeah. my next question is the selection rules you showed, if I understood correctly, they are only applicable for a toroidal field. No, they apply to, uh, so toroidal or solenoidal fields. And actually all these, if you assume uh, cylindrical symmetry, 
uh, these are the only things you can write down. And, uh, but we do, so we are not talking about cavities in this context, we are talking about, uh, yeah, this sort of uh, experiment. So how does it change if you move to a cavity-based? In cavities is completely different because here, what, what, what you measure is a magnetic flux, whereas here, uh, well, you just have to write down how the, I mean, the modes of the equation, uh, sorry, the modes of the cavity, and uh, yeah, that's different. So the, the, the observable is something else. It's not a magnetic flux in a pick -up loop. Yeah. Any other question or in Zoom? If there are no questions. Please thank Camilo again. And we can reconvene in half an hour, so at quarter to five.